pink moon. For the first April full moon. Pink like a painted egg. An eastered egg. Shades of cherry blossom, dogwood, magnolia. Grass moon, planting moon. Lighting over the greening and flowering earth. Moon of my birth month, full with promise. Moon when the ice breaks. Magaxika ugly we, the Lakota called it. Moon when the ducks return. Welcome to the latest floating poetry broadcast. And thank you for leaning in. Some of you for the first time, some of you from time to time, others all the time. I hope all of you, freshly, readily. I'm very glad you're here for show 153 in my ongoing weekly series, coming to you live from the coast of Rhode Island, whose name, the Ocean State, is well-deserved. This is your poet and poetorialist Colin Goedeke, a voice for living our days more fully, more alively, more poetically. In show 152, we chose our words wisely. We read, listened in to the lingua franca of our lives, the ways we live in and with and through words, use them to shape our thoughts, our days, our world in wise to willful ways, first words to last, early to evolved, from the written to the spoken to the sung. We mused on words as food, as a bond, as code or creed, as inspiration, as revelation, as love, as healing, and more, which inspired in turn, in a way, this week's theme, What's in a Name? The names were given or choose for ourselves and how they actively and unconsciously shape our identity and how others relate to us. The resonance of famous or historic people and places, place names, real to fictional to mythical. The nicknames we we give to friends, family members, colleagues, the monikers of our own we give to all kinds of things, from pets to objects. Not to mention the nameless and unnameable we encounter, experience, or feel. So, let's sit back a while and look, muse, and discover together through a lens of cultural commentary, poetry, and shared inquiry into the shaping and meaning of our names and namings. All right, well, why don't we start with um, the opening of Herman Melville's classic novel, Moby Dick, which opens with a name. If you know the novel, you know what, how it begins. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me, that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off. Then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings toward the ocean with me. Ishmael, he's a fascinating character in that story. 
uh, Eduardo Galeano, the Uruguayan uh, writer. Window on Arrival. Pilar and Daniel Weinberg's son was baptized on the coast. The baptism taught him what was sacred. They gave him a seashell and said, So you'll learn to love the water. They opened a cage and let a bird go free. So you'll learn to love the air. They gave him a geranium. So you'll learn to love the earth. And they gave him a little bottle sealed up tight saying, Don't ever, ever open it. So you'll learn to love mystery. Thank you, Eduardo Galliano. And what I love here, too, is the focus, um, not on a new child's name, but, but reverently and, and firstly uh, on creating a connection, or facilitating one with nature and beauty and mystery for that, for that new child. Yeah. So we can be baptized with, in other ways, not just with a name. Emmett uh, Tenorio Melendez, my name came from... My name came from my great-great-great-grandfather. He was an Indian from the Choctaw tribe. His name was Dark Ant. When he went to get a job out in a city, he changed it to Emmett. And his whole name was Emmett Perez Denorio. And my name means Ant, strong, carry twice its size. Thank you, Emmett Denorio Melendez. Philip Levine is a, was a once poet laureate. He's not on earth anymore, but he's certainly floating in all his beautiful words. And I didn't know a lot about his work and come into it uh, very happily. Quite something. And this is uh, one of his. I wanted to honor him with this poem, The First Truth. The second truth is that the rose blooms and the dark petals burn to dust or wind. And when nothing is left, someone remembers it was once spring and hurries through the snow on the way home from a day's work, his quilted jacket bunched high about his neck against the steady December wind. The day ends before anyone is ready, even this single man who lives alone and feeds two stray cats and himself on large tins of exotic ocean fish drowned in mustard sauce or unpeeled potatoes boiled and left to cool. He sings as he shaves, staring into his eyes, which to him are as mysterious as the eyes of the two striped cats or the dark eyes of the black woman who worked beside him all that day and sighed just the once after she'd finished her small lunch of soda pop and processed cheese and stood up to return to her job. She wore a small wedding ring and a gold cross on a gold chain. In the mirror, he sees his own silver chain disappear under his shirt and the thick arms that want to crush someone he has never known against his body. He wants to stand in silence warm against the wind, which he knows is blowing because it blew that morning on the way to work and that evening on the way back. He stands, half-shaven, staring into a face that is suddenly his own face, which has given him a name ever since he could speak. He steps back as far as he can to see all of the man he would give up if you knocked at his door. The first truth. Thank you, Philip Levine. Thank you for that. Erica Young said, uh, to name oneself is the first act of both the poet and the revolutionary. And Richard uh, Feynman, scientist, I learned very early the difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something. About that one. A lot in that one short line. Uh, from Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, book, Gathering Moss, wonderful, wonderful book, how naming confers dignity upon life and gives meaning to existence. In there, she said, finding the words is another step in learning to see. I'll give you a little bit from that, what she says in there. You might enjoy the whole book. The names we use for rocks and other beings depends on our perspective, whether we are speaking from the inside or the outside of the circle. The name on our lips reveals the knowledge we have of each other, hence the sweet secret names we have for the ones we love. The names we give ourselves are a powerful form of self-determination, of declaring ourselves sovereign territory. Outside the circle, scientific names for mosses may suffice, but inside the circle, what do they call themselves? 
I find strength and comfort in this physical intimacy with the land, a sense of knowing the names of the rocks and knowing my place in the world. In indigenous ways of knowing, all beings are recognized as non-human persons and all have their own names. It is a sign of respect to call a being by its name and a sign of disrespect to ignore it. Words and names are the ways we humans build relationships not only with each other, but also with plants. Intimate connection allows recognition in an all-too-often anonymous world. Intimacy gives us a different way of seeing. Thank you, Robin Wall. Kimmerer, sometimes described as a Thoreau of botany. Modern Thoreau. Well, you know I sometimes have questions, or almost always have questions for us, for you. So here are some about names. One is, how attached are you to your name? Your first name, or your last name, your family name. How much of your identity, your sense of self or worth, or relationship to the world, to the culture, or history, is tied to any or all parts of your name? Is that something you've ever thought about? We're maybe going to start thinking now about that. What do you love most about your name, your moniker, and what, if anything, do you like least? Are you someone who's changed their name or prefer to go by a nickname? If so, why? And if so, what happened? What was outwardly different or inwardly felt afterward, after the change? Did you have a nickname as a kid? What was it? And what nicknames have you given to others in your life, in childhood or since then? Maybe a wife or a husband, a lover, a friend, a co-worker. Have you ever named a car or a boat or a house or renamed something and more uniquely or colorfully for yourself, your own private or preferred reference? I say that because uh, I can't be alone in naming things like that. I've named most of the places I've lived in, including a gatekeeper's cottage I had in New Jersey way back in time that I called Inkwells. A uh, co-op I had for decades in Central Park in New York, I named Il Faro, the lighthouse, because of all the sunlight that poured into it through a wall of tall French windows facing south and the light of vital living that beamed and beaconed out from it. My prior car was an old BMW sedan I named Orion. It was my starship that took me through the galaxy. My current chariot is an old Mercedes-Benz I call the Seahorse. I love to ride on up and down the coast here. And, and I recently added uh, an electric scooter, uh, black, jet black, uh, and I've styled that the little black mambo. Yeah, so love naming things. What about your uh, great favorite names of a person or a place or a pet or a thing? What are some of those? And are there feelings or sensations you have or have had that have been difficult or impossible to name? Can you imagine not having a name at all? What might that be like? If you were to give this year in your life a name so far for how it's unfolding or how you'd like it to unfold, what would it be? What would you name it? The year of what? The year of the what? And what about these times we're living in? The something era, what would you call that? The blank era, how would you fill that blank in? Remember what Dickens wrote in the tale of two cities, his great novel and how it begins. Here it is. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period 
that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. Well, I, I don't know about you, my friends, but to me, uh, Dickens could be writing this about our very times, these very times we're living in. Well, we have many, many types of uh, names, types of names, kinds, like brand names, nicknames, signatures, aliases, appellations, autographs, epithets, metronymics, patronymics, monikers, rubrics, sobriquets, noms de guerre, noms de plume, pen names, pet names, proper names, stage names, and more. And uh, what's in a name from uh, writingtips.org? Definition, meaning, and examples. What's in a name is an idiom that dates back to the 16th and 17th centuries. It means that while a title or name may imply a specific rank, family, designation, or station, um, its implication may not be accurate. Well, it originates with William Shakespeare uh, and uh, Romeo and Juliet. And uh, from uh, the um, no sweat Shakespeare.com site, a soliloquy analysis, Romeo and Juliet, spoken by her in Act 2, Scene 2, she said, What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And their translation or analysis. Juliet, a Capulet, is not allowed to associate with Romeo because he is a Montague. If he had any other name, it would be fine. She com she's complaining that his name is meaningless. If the Rose had any other name, it would still be the same. So with Romeo, he would still be the same beautiful young man, even if he had a different name. She knows that the blood feud prevents her from loving a Montague. She ponders it. It's only your name that's the enemy. Romeo, take off your name and in exchange for that whole name which is not really a part of what you are. You can have all of me. From psychology today. What's in a name? How one's name shapes identity in the course of a life. Well, this a piece by uh, Molly uh, Castello starts with a picture of the famous painting of a pipe by the Belgian artist René Magritte. And there's a pipe, very simple. And underneath, in script, it says, Ceci n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. Well, of course, the um, what that's all about is it is it, it looks like a pipe. It's painted as a pipe, but it's not a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe. And there you have the story of that. So in this piece, it says, A name is, is quote, like an elongated shadow attached at our heels. Mavis Himes, H-I-M-E-S, writes in her new book, or her book, The Power of Names. Our first name marks our singularity among the family. When a child is given the same name as his father or mother, how does this influence their identification with that parent? Our surname defines us in relation to our parents, customarily the father. And um, this tradition enforces family structure with the father at the head and reaffirms identification with one's ancestry. When the paternal surname wields precedence over the maternal, how does this impact a female sense of authority and voice? How does the structure of the nuclear family affect a woman, woman's thinking about herself, the pursuit of her own wants, and her quest for identity? This uh, is a piece of mine, the name you were given. This is from my fine Norwegian friend, Jan Rik, on his birthday. I was actually talking with him, collaborating with him on something. And I said, well, I might have a surprise for you. It just so happens I, yeah, I didn't tell him what I was going to do, which was to read this poem I'd written for him back in 2020 on his birthday. The name you were given, Scandinavianly a gift from the gods and family and united and loyal history. A name that fits your interior, your coastline, your mind and heartline, your solar days, 
your polar nights. Now to you, my good friend, Yonrik. From learning-mind.com, how the power of names influences our life according to science. This, I have to say, my friends, was revelational. I never uh, know what I'm going to uncover when I source material for us. So many uh, interesting things. Uh, good surprises, usually. And um, so, I'm sorry, we have some, I've left, a, oh, I'm, I'm so happy to throw open wide the uh, big um, sliding glass door into the, uh, to the night and the air it was 80 degrees here today. It was quite wonderful. But we might hear some other interference out there, but don't, don't mind that. So yes, from this article, is there such a thing as a powerful name? More to the point, can our names have an influence on our lives and what's behind that power? Yes, interesting. I'll give you some slices. Letters have their own personality. The first factor to consider is that we assign personality traits to letters. It's called the Bupa Kiki effect. B-O-U-B-A-K-I-K-A. Letters with rounded shapes and sounds are called Bupa, and letters with sharp silhouettes are Kiki. Moreover, we associate these different personality traits to names that include those letters. So a name with rounded letters like Molly indicates an easygoing nature and warmth. A name with sharp letters such as Eric is associated with coldness and determination. This shows that even the letters of our names have a powerful influence. Names can sound hard or soft. Harder sounding names are associated with power or masculinity. Names that do not produce vocal vibration are softer and breathier. Think Marilyn Monroe. People associate these kinds of names with feminine attributes. Unfortunately, this perpetuates the gender stereotype and just shows how the power of our names has such an influence. Then they go on to talk about we, how we prefer almost everybody, simple, uncomplicated names, like the last few presidents, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, um, and judge these names in a more positive light than more complicated ones. If you have a simple name, research, research shows that you will get a better paid job. You will win more votes in elections. In general, you'll be viewed in a more positive way. How about that? I did not know that. Um, we also like names we can pronounce easily. Uh, we gravitate to them. And there's more in this piece, but uh, I'm pointing it out to you. and passing it on to you. Well, as some know, I'm fond of playing with names of all kinds, including people, the uh, names of people I know, and juggling them and converting and reinventing them in some way. Uh, well, here's one for my so fine Italian-American friend, John Tosca, for his 90th birthday this past October. And it's called Fantasca. The taste and zest for life you bring to each day. The love you pour like wine into family and friends. The prayers you say for the well-being of us all to the higher heavens. The art you've made and given still make and give with joy. The world, the history, the beauty, this westerly you've beheld for a near century. The deep spirit of Italy, generosity, and the true gentlemanly we see in your face, we hear in your voice. And the fine heart, the beautiful, irreplaceable heart that beats so agelessly within your frame is felt so gladly, beyond gratefully, within ours. How fantastica. Out to him, out to my dear friend John Tasca. For Jimmy Roberts on his birthday in this very year, February, uh, riffing on the well-known song, the children's song, Frère Jacques is the title. Are you singing? Yes, you're singing. Brother Jim, Brother Jim, all your heart is flowing. All your gifts are showing. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And uh, for my wonderful uh, westerly friend, Pat Morton, who I know is listening, so I'm delighted to bring this in to our program on her birthday of this year, also February, Morton's Salt. Like the iconic umbrella girl walking carefree in the rain, scattering bright crystals in her wake. Like the motto, when it rains, it pours. Whether it's stormy or sunny, she pours her lovely self into each day. Seasons the passing seasons. Adds flavor to any time you spend with her. 
Oh, there you are in love out your way. In my uh, sourcings for us, I was also thinking of iconic characters we have names for, like, like the cowboys of the Old West and soldiers of the world's wars, or our civil war, explorers, great statesmen in history, pioneers, mountaineers, shepherds in their Arcadias, farmers tilling the land, and others. Well, here's one from my exhibition of 2018, Behind the Curtain. This is one of the characters. The cowboy always holds on to his hat, if not his horse, when he rides into town, especially near sunup and sundown, especially when he swings his big shoulders through the bat-wing doors of the Old West Saloon, where villainy or sweet company could be waiting around the fast-flowing whiskey. The cowboy. There's another one, another kind of cowboy, the gaucho. This is from the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico, 1999. El gaucho caribe. A cowboy sits astride a fine white mare. He rides high and handsome above the jade-streaked waves. A soft shirt blouses at his back. A crisp straw hat with a long bent brim shades his rugged red earth face and thick ink-black mustacho. As he passes by, he twirls his coil of rope into lazy, lassoed O's. El Gaucho Caribe. Well, I asked you a little earlier about nicknames and how you feel about them. Well, Ernest Hemingway was affectionately known by a slew of them, including Ernie, Hemi, Oinbones, Champ, and of course, Papa. He was born in 1899. He was an amateur boxer and bullfighting aficionado, a hunting enthusiast, and marrier of many spouses. And first and foremost, he was a writer, of course. He was also a coiner of words. Well, I'm just throwing this in as we talk about nicknames for a moment. That, uh, but he created and popularized quite a few, including Byline, uh, Spooked, to have been around, and this one, Moment of Truth. From Death in the Afternoon, 1932, he wrote, The whole end of the bullfight was the final sword thrust. The actual encounter between the man and the animal, what the Spanish call the moment of truth. Well, the moment of truth or a crucial point in time comes from the Spanish bullfighting term el momento de la verdad, which refers to the final thrust of the sword that kills the bull. And not pleasant to witness. I did once, many, many years ago. A friend was quite a studier of, uh, uh, in an elevated way of bullfighting and took me once to Tijuana to see one long time ago and I was very it was exciting but it was also distressing and it, I never needed to do that again and he was rather Hemingway-esque himself that day and otherwise um, speaking of Ishmael again uh, but a different Ishmael Ishmael Reed the poet here points of view the pioneers and the Indians disagree about a lot of things for example the pioneer says that when you meet a bear in the woods you should yell at him and if that doesn't work, you should fell him. The Indians say that you should whisper to him softly and call him by loving nicknames. No one's bothered to ask the bear what he thinks. Thank you, Ishmael Reed. Well, two Junes ago, I was up in Midcoast, Maine, uh, staying with dear friends Alan and Angela in uh, Owl's Head. And in my room was a large, beautiful, tender portrait of the actor, Johnny Weissmiller, famed for playing Tarzan in the old Hollywood movie days. Well, I looked at that and I saw a different person, you know, behind, the, behind that character, behind that persona of Tarzan. So this is the poem for Johnny Weissmiller called Tarzan's Room. The name I give the room I sleep in on in this house, on this street, to the sea. Because over the bed is a vintage portrait of the figure I grew up watching, swinging through the jungle, living in the wild, being free. But I see this as an inside-out portrait of a beautifully tender man, a tenderly beautiful man. His eyes turned privately, quietly, away from the camera, from the viewer looking somewhere far away, far within. And his skin, his soft, sun-brown face and monumentally shaped, gracefully rounded shoulders, so luminous, 
with aliveness, with a light of his own making, of Johnny's incandescing. Tarzan's room. Yeah. Well, I was also uh, thinking, not just of nicknames, but of, uh, uh, of the nom de plume. Yeah, from, uh, this is from f- uh, flavor, flavorwide.com. Yeah, uh, different writers use them over time. Famous ones, past and present. Uh, how about this one? From the age of 16, Benjamin Franklin didn't just use pen names. He created entire personas, often quite different from himself. For example, his first nom de plume, Silence Do Good, was a widowed woman several decades older than then teenage Ben. He used these characters to many ends, from the frivolous to the serious. Through names like Anthony Afterwit and Alice Addertongue, Franklin humorously examined society, spread gossip, or exposed the flaws in conventional thought. Polly Baker, for example, was an alter ego he used to show that women were discriminated against by the law. Baker was the former mistress of several important men, raised their illegitimate children, and was punished while the fathers got off. Scott Free. I won't read it now because I want to stay in time with some other things I have for us, but uh, there's a fascinating uh, writer, uh, poet, Fernando Pessoa, P-E-S-S-O-A. This is from centerfiction.org. One of the most fascinating figures in the history of pseudonymity. Uh, to pretend is to know oneself, he once wrote, and he pretended relentlessly. He was born in Lisbon, Portugal, 1888. He employed more than 70 pseudonyms, and he regarded them as separate from him, himself. He called them heteronyms, and he said he, they had no control over what he did. Well, I can tell you that having read him in these different personas, they feel and sound entirely different, as if they were coming from very different people. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, and they, they all looked different. Different. One was a hunchback, another wore a monocle. One uh, fascinating figure. He died in 1935, rather obscurely, and he left behind a trunk with 30,000 fragments of his writing, much of it still untranslated. Yeah, intriguing fellow. Well, um, you know, I was thinking about uh, the naming of uh, nature, things in nature, and sometimes how they don't always give us all the idiosyncrasies below the surface. Um, you know, like the Eskimos who have so many words for different kinds of snow, like 40 plus words. I'm going to mention that maybe in a moment. Um, so, yeah, we have the basic words for the wind, the clouds, the rain, the sun, and so on, but so much more about each one and each dimension, sub-dimension. Um, here's the name of the, that silence, is These Grasses in the Wind, by Jerome Ellis. The name of that silence is these grasses in this wind, and the name of these grasses in this wind is that other place on the other side of this instant. This instant is divided by curtains of water and the sound of shuddering time, a sunflower reeling with sun, six hands stretched in offering. This unsearchable, uncancelable instant wraps the shoulders of the grasses like a sh- shawl stilled by the stoppage. White pines whistle skyward. With our being shaped to songs of praise, writes the 5th century theologian Pseudo Dionysius, what the scripture writers have to say regarding the divine names refers in revealing praises to the beneficent processions of God. What processes from this instant? Find the ceremony in every instant. Every condition, movement, life, imagination, conjecture, name, discourse, thought, inception, being, rest, dwelling, unity, limit, infinity, the totality of existence. What is the name of this instant? Where is the name of this instant? Swimming in the Rappahannock, clinging to the swollen belly of that ruby-throated hummingbird. Bring anonymity, writes poet Tim Lilburn. This morning, come shyly or boldly into the fertile field, however you are. Come, come and stay in the rearrangement, the pressure of thumb on fescue blade, a year wheeling within a day, two round moments of warm mouth, finally at peace. The psalm is a key, if only we can find the door. Do not swallow your disfluent voice. Let it erupt in its volcanic flowering. Stoppage, then passage, aporia, poppy bursting with fragrant seed. Thank you, Jerome Ellis, from his collection, Zoe Glossia. And I mentioned the Eskimos, well, from treehugger.com. Old Henrik Maga, 
A linguist in Norway points out that the northern Scandinavian Sami tribe use more than 180 words related to snow and ice, and as many as a thousand for reindeer. Well, this uh, Matthew Sturm, a geophysicist with the Army Corps of Engineers in Alaska, um, talks about the Inuits and their words for snow and ice formations. Now, I just thought they were some wonderful. I'll give you a few as we go. Uh, Kripriana, snow that looks blue in the early morning. Hirila, snow in beards. Tilamo, snow that falls in large wet flakes. Tilaslo, snow that falls slowly. And Tulun, snow sparkling with moonlight. Wonderful. Naming the Animals by Anthony Hecht. Having commanded Adam to bestow names upon all the creatures, God withdrew to Empyrean place palaces of blue that warm and windless morning long ago, and seemed to take no notice of the vexed look on the young man's face as he took thought of all the miracles the Lord had wrought, now to be labeled, dubbed, eclept, indexed. Before an addled mind and puddled brow, the feathered nation and the finny prey passed by, there went biped and quadruped. Adam looked forth with bottomless dismay into the tragic eyes of his first cow, and shyly ventured, Thou shalt be called Fred. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony Hecht. Very, very amusing. Oscar Wilde said, It is a sad truth, but we have lost the faculty of giving lovely names to things. And Amy Sadara said, I've named everything that I've ever owned, real or inanimate. I have to give it a first and last name. Everything in my apartment comes alive at night. How about that? How about that? Well, I'm looking at all our wonderful material, and I'm going to have to edit on the fly a bit just to keep us in good time. Well, this is an enduring name I love and have used ever since, the, the first naming back in New York City in 2001 of things. This is the Great White Biscuit. Some of you may know this one. Our moniker for the mattress and box spring, the king-sized bed, the often enflowered bower of bliss we call the Great White Biscuit. Our life raft, our spacecraft, our deep seabed where dreams swim and love is made, where old films play, where cats have curled, where we unfurl ourselves after a long day's journey into night. This bountiful broad billow of down and foam, the home plate where we slide, safe and sound, this comforting and comfortable layer cake for two, this soft and so delicious great white biscuit. Directions to My Imaginary Childhood by Nick Carbo. If you stand on the corner of Mabidi Street and La Gaspi Avenue, Wait for an orchid-colored minibus with seven oblong doors. Open the fourth door. An oscillating electric fan will be driving. Tell her to proceed to the Escolta Diamond District. You will pass Manang Vire's Bar, La Isla de la Ladrones Bookshop, the Frederick Funston Fish Sauce Factory, and as you turn left into Calle de Recuerdos, you will see Breton, Bataille, and Camus seated around a card table playing uh, ABC Dairy and Dominoes. Roll down your window and ask them if... Mr. Florent and Miss Laura are home. And if the answer is yes, then proceed to Noli Mi Tangeri Park and wait for a nun named Maria Clara. If the answer is je ne sais pas, then turn right under the parking lot of Cicatuna's supermarket to buy a basket full of Lanzones fruit, then get back to Calle de Recuerdos until you reach the part that's lined with tungsten red Juan Tamad trees. On the right will be a house with an acknowledgments page and an index. Open the door and enter this page, and look me in the eye. Thank you, Nick Carbo. Well, I have a marvelous musician friend, uh, guitarist and folk singer Grant Peterson, and once after um, him glowing on about a Stratocaster, I went into imagining other kinds of, of these um, instruments. This is called the Stratocaster for Grant Peterson. The Fender Strat fabled electric guitar. But what about the hydrocaster that plays water music? The heliocaster that casts sunbursts and shadows? 
the nanocaster that reverbs in microdoses, and the ultra-rare hydrocaster that trebles and timbers hieroglyphics into the ears. What, um, I'll need a little water first. What songs do you know or remember or like whose title is a name? Eleanor Rigby, The Beatles, Dion's Run Around Sue, Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good, Janis Joplin's Me and Bobby McGee, Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline, Johnny Cash's A Boy Named Sue, Paul Simon, Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard, and Simon and Garfunkel, Mrs. Robinson. Of course, there's lots more, but there's a few that uh, struck me. I'm going to pass on, although he's wonderful, Dickens had so many great character names uh, uh, from Sweetle Pipe and Honey Thunder and Bumble and Pumblechook. Yeah, if you uh, don't know about some of those characters, they're, they're such great fun. But I'm going to pass on that for now. And I'm talking to you about Robin Hood and when he's dubbed uh, Sir Robin of Locksley by the king. I love that moment, just uh, like hearing that. Yeah. That's what I call my friend Robin. Robin of Westerly. Yeah. There's a sort of ring to that, you know? Okay. Um, but speaking of uh, vintage uh, films for a moment, there were, there were certain Hollywood golden era actors that I was so taken with, still am taken with. And I wrote a poem about them, Five Men I Love. I wrote this back in 2021. Five Men I Love. Identify with natural men, soulful men, in their characters, for their character. Clark Gable, when it, it happened one night. Ronald Coleman on his lost horizon. As a prisoner of Zenda. Jimmy Stewart living a wonderful life. You can't take it with you. James Fox during his passage to India. Leslie Howard traversing the painted desert. Turning into a scarlet pimpernel. And what about the names of... Uh, mythical and legendary places and what they conjure in your imagination. The lost city of Atlantis. Shangri-La. Oz, as in the Wizard of Oz. Camelot. And, uh, yeah, Camelot. Richard Harris, uh, of course, made that rather famous. Do you, do you know how that began? It's, it's true, it's true. The crown has made it clear. The climate must be perfect all the year. A law was made a distant moon ago here. July and August cannot be too hot. And there's a legal limit to the snow here in Camelot. And on it goes. Yeah, good. And how about um, Xanadu? And uh, that was the, the English poet Samuel Coleridge who wrote in, the, wrote, uh, in 1816 Kubla Khan. And the, it's on a, on a vision and a dream, a fragment. It says... And here's the opening. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forest ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery. Xanadu. Well, we poets uh, can have vital naming powers. And uh, as uh, Salman Rushdie has said, a poet's work is to name the unnameable, to point at frauds, to take sides, to start arguments, shape the world, and stop it going to sleep. I concur with that. I do. Rebecca Solnit, this is from the Marginalian, on rewriting the world's broken stories and the paradigm-shifting power of calling things by their true names. It's from her book, Call Them By Their True Names. I'll give you a little moment from that. In the deep past, people knew names had power. Some still do. Calling things by their true names cuts through the lies that excuse, buffer, muddle, disguise, avoid, or encourage inaction, indifference, obliviousness. It's not all there is to changing the world, but it's a key step. To name something truly is to lay bare what may be brutal or corrupt or important or possible. 
and key to the work of changing the world is changing the story. Yes. Well, I want to um, share, I must share this, uh, thinking so much about our world right now and, uh, of course, around naming uh, as our theme, but this actually ties in in, a, in an interesting way and maybe a synchronistic way. So it's, it's slightly longer, but I think, I think we should read it. Um, yeah. Just a moment. Okay. Lady Liberty by Tato Laviera. For liberty, your day filled in splendor. July 4th, New York Harbor, 1986. Midnight sky. Fireworks splashing. Heaven exploding into radiant bouquets. Wall Street, a backdrop of centennial adulation. Computerized capital angling cameras celebrating the international symbol of freedom stretched across microchips, AWACS surveillance, wall-to-wall people, sailing ships, gliding armies ferried in pursuit of happiness, constitution adoration, packaged television channels for liberty, immigrant illusions celebrated in the name of democratic principles. God bless America, land of the star-spangled banner that we love. But the symbol suffered 100 years of decay, climbing up to the spined crown, the fractured torch hand, the ruptured intestines, palms blistered and calloused, feet embroidered in rust, centennial decay, the lady's eyes cataract filled, exposed to sun and snow, a salty wind, discolored verses staining her robe. She needed remolding, redesigning. The decomposed body now melted down for souvenirs, lungs and limbs jailed in scaffolding of ugly cubicles, incarcerating the body as she prepared to receive her 20th century transplant, paid for by pitching pennies, hometown chicken barbecues, marathons on America's main streets. She heard the speeches. The presidents, the French and American partners, the nation believed in her, rooted for the queen, and Lady Liberty decided to reflect on Lincoln's emancipatory resoluteness, on Washington's patriotism on Jefferson's lucidity, on William Jennings Bryan's socialism, on Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations, on Roosevelt's New Deal, on Kennedy's ecumenical postures, and on Martin Luther King's nonviolence. Lady Liberty decided to reflect on Lillian Wald's settlements, on Helen Keller's Sixth Sense, on Susan B. Anthony's suffrage movement, on Mother Cabrini's giving soul, on Harriet Tubman's stubborn pursuit of freedom. Just before she was touched, Just before she was dismantled, Lady Liberty spoke. She spoke for the principles, for the preamble, for the Bill of Rights, and 39 peaceful presidential transitions. And just before she was touched, Lady Liberty wanted to convey her own resolutions, her own bicentennial goals, so that in 2086, she would be smiling and she would be proud. And then just before she was touched, and then while she was being reconstructed, and then while she was being celebrated, she spoke. If you touch me, touch all of my people who need attention and societal repair. Give the tired and the poor the same attention, America. Touch us all with liberty. Touch us all with liberty. Hunger abounds. Our soil is plentiful. Our technology advanced enough to feed the world, to feed humanity's hunger. But let's celebrate not our wealth, not our sophisticated defense, not our scientific advancements, not our intellectual adventures. Let us concentrate on our weaknesses, on our societal needs, for we will never be free if indeed freedom is subjugated to trampling upon people's needs. This is a warning, my beloved America. So touch me, and in touching me, touch all our people. Do not single me out. Touch all our people. Touch all our people. All our people. Our people. People. And then I shall truly enjoy my day, filled in splendor, July 4th, New York Harbor, 1986, Midnight Sky. Fireworks splashing, heaven exploding into radiant bouquets, celebrating in the name of equality in the pursuit of happiness. God bless America, land of stars, spangled banner that we love. Wonderful. New to me, Lady Liberty from Benedicion, Tato La Viera. Thank you so much for that. A timely, timely thing. Yes. All right, well... We are going to have so many other good things, but we can't get to them all. Can't get to them. I'll point you to at thepoetryfoundation.org there and then, the poem by Michael Brennan. Um, Maybe I'll read this one. 
by uh, Ross Gay. Sorrow is not my name. No matter the pull toward brink, no matter the flora deep sleep awaits, there is time for everything. Look, just this morning a vulture nodded his red grizzled head at me, and I looked at him, admiring the sickle of his beak. Then the wind kicked up, and after arranging that good suit of feathers, he up and took off. Just like that. And to boot, there are on this planet alone something like two million naturally occurring sweet things, some with names so generous as to kick the steel from my knees. Agave, persimmon, stickball, the purple okra I bought for two bucks at the market. Think of that. The long night, the skeleton in the mirror, the man behind me on the bus taking notes. Yeah, yeah. But look, my niece is running through a field calling my name. My neighbor sings like an angel, and at the end of my block is a basketball court. I remember. My color's green. I'm spring. Thank you, Ross Gay, for bringing the shovel down, that collection. Helen Hoyt, name. My name is beautiful to me when you say it. A new name. No one ever had this name before. Your voice changes it. It is a new name, sacred, never till now spoken, or any touch laid on it. The great... Uh, Poet from way back in time, uh, Rabindranath Tagore. Leave out my name from the gift, if it be a burden, but keep my song. Another poem to point you to po- at the Poetry Foundation.org, My Mother's Music by Emily Buchwald. B U C H W A L D. To his mother, whose name was Maria, by uh, Attilio Bertolucci, translated from the Italian by Cyrus Cassels, to his mother, whose name was Maria, invoked every sundown, it's you, painted on clouds, rouging our treasured plain, and all who walk it, with leaf-fresh kids and women damp from traveling, city-bound, in the radiance of a just-stopped shower. It's you, mother eternally young, courtesy of death's plucking hand, rose at the fragrant point of unpetaling, you who are the alpha of every neurosis, every torturing anxiety. And for this, I give you gratitude for time past, time present, time future. Thank you, Attilio Bertolucci. Grazie, signore. All right, coming now to our last uh, musings and sharings for now. Uh, Martin uh, Sorescu. Getting used to your name. After you've learned to walk, Tell one thing from another. Your first care as a child is to get used to your name. What is it? They keep asking you. You hesitate, stammer. And when you start to give a fluent answer, your name's no longer a problem. When you start to forget your name, it's very serious. But don't despair. An interval will set in. And soon after your death, when the mist rises from your eyes and you begin to find your way in the everlasting darkness, your first care, long forgotten, long since buried with you, is to get used to your name. You're called, just as arbitrarily, dandelion, cowslip, cornell, blackbird, chaffinch, turtle dove, customary, zephyr, or all these together. And when you nod to show you've got it, everything's all right. The earth, almost round, may spin like a top among stars. Thank you. Martin Sorescu from his collection Hands Behind My Back. April 1998, New York City. The now flowering red bud. That nameless color between mauve and rose grows newly from the tines of delicate wood wandering from the slender young body of our neighboring red bud tree. Jane Kenyon. Briefly it enters and briefly speaks. I am the blossom pressed in a book found again after two hundred years. I am the maker, the lover, and the keeper. When the young girl who starves sits down to do a table, she will sit beside me. I am food on the prisoner's plate. I am water rushing to the wellhead, filling the pitcher until it spills. I am the patient gardener of the dry and weedy garden. I am the stone step, the latch, and the working hinge. I am the heart contracted by joy the longest hair white before the rest. I am there in the basket of fruit presented to the widow. I am the musk rose opening unattended, the fern on the boggy summit. I am the one whose love overcomes you, 
already with you when you think to call my name. Thank you, Jane Kenyon, for that. Uh, next to last, a roomy poem. Unfold your own myth. Who gets up early to discover the moment light begins? Who finds us here circling, bewildered like atoms? Who comes to a spring thirsty and sees the moon reflected in it? Who, like Jacob, blind with grief and age, smells the shirt of his lost son and can see again? Who lets a bucket down and brings up a flowing prophet? Or, like Moses, goes for fire and finds what burns inside the sunrise? Jesus slips into a house to escape enemies and opens a door to the other world. Solomon cuts open a fish and there's a gold ring. Omar storms in to kill the prophet and leaves with blessings. Chase a deer and end up everywhere. An oyster opens his mouth to swallow on one drop. Now there's a pearl. A vagrant wanders empty ruins. Suddenly he's wealthy. But don't be satisfied with stories how things have gone with others. Unfold your own myth without complicated explanation so everyone will understand the passage. We have opened you. Start walking toward Shams. Your legs will get heavy and tired. Then comes a moment of feeling the wings you've grown lifting. Thank you, Rumi. And last for now, friends. Uh, last for now. Um, when you hear the tone, when you hear the tone, it will be spring. It will be time to spring. It will be your day. It will be a fine and festive day. When you hear the tone, may it be the high note of your spirit sounding, the deep note of your so resonant self ringing. What calls you to yourself, your deeper, fuller self, dear listeners? The cosmic ring of your name and everything within it. Thank you again for leaning in, listening, and, and feeling in. And thank you for sharing these shows with others. Freely post the show link or playlist on to your friends or to your social media. I'm always keen to grow the listenership. I also invite and greatly appreciate your comments, your reflections, your affirmations, and likewise your donations. They do help these shows go on. Is there any theme you'd like me to build a broadcast around? Uh, going forward? If so, send an email with your request to me, Colin at thepoetorialist.com. And what about your experience of this show on what's in a name? I would love to know. If you're making a contribution, you can use Venmo to fivefold, F-I-V-E-F-O-L-D, at pipeline.com, or PayPal to the same email, or simply mail a check to me at P.O. Box 1032, Westerly, Rhode Island, 02891, or donate through my site, thepoetorialist.com, in the Donate tab. Patrons can, as always, sponsor or host me at times seasonally as a working poet in residence for an agreed time in an agreed place in the U.S. or elsewhere in the world to create a new flight of poetic art dedicated to them. Meanwhile, you can hear all the broadcasts online, on YouTube, on the floating poetry playlist. I hope you'll lean in soon again. Till then, dear listeners... Consider the identity and effect of the names you live with, christened to chosen, the names that float about in the world, the culture, and the sensations and associations they carry, the names from the cherished to the invented that fill and spice your particular days, your thoughts and conversations, your hearts and imaginations. Yes, goodbye for now, and good spirits.